should use my NPR voice. You guys listen to NPR? I, I, I always say along with it when they're like, live from Washington. Um, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Hi, guys. It's been a long time since I was here. I think three years, three and a half years. We were trying to figure it out earlier. Um, actually, it was a different store. So I've never been here. Woo! Uh, when I was coming in, a man asked me if I was here for a massage. I was like, nope. <laughs> no, we're not, not right here for a massage. I'm not sure why you asked me that. Um, yeah, so how, how far did everybody come? Are you guys from San Diego, most of you? It's not. It's anyone? You're not? Oh, wow. That. Where is that? Well, thank you for coming two hours. I appreciate that. I, last night, I've only ever been to Denver twice for signings, uh, twice ever. And both times it snowed. And apparently Denver doesn't like snow, even though I always think of Colorado as like a snowy place. But no, they were like, we don't drive in snow. And that stank both times because people didn't come. But I had one girl who drove four hours and I was like, mm, in the snow, thank you. It's his true commitment. So you didn't beat her, I'm afraid. <laughs> she, she wins the award. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure what the award is. My math. Uh, so, you guys, I don't really have a spiel beyond I can tell you about the luminaries, which I will do. And then I'm hoping you'll think of awesome questions to ask me so we can fill some time. And then for the virtual crowd, are there like virtual questions? Okay, well, if there are any, you just, just raise your hand. Yeah. Uh, so, the luminaries was an idea I tried to sell back in 2013. Uh, my first series, Something Strange and Deadly, was with Harper Teen, who does a very certain type of book, uh, very commercial books. And I try, I came up with this world of Hemlock Falls and the Luminaries with the Seven Clans and Winnie Wednesday and Jay Friday. And I tried to sell it to, the, I like gave them the proposal and they were like, nope, we're not interested, which is fine. At that time, Paranormal was definitely on the outs, so I understood why they weren't into it. Um, everyone was publishing dystopian in 2013. And so, and, and, and fantasy was like just starting to become popular. So I was like, well, I also have this thing called truth, Witch. would you be interested in that? No, <laughs> they only wanted it. If I would make it one point of view and first person. And I know, I know it really defeats the whole point of the book, which has like seven points of view now. Um, and like, to be, again, to be fair, I don't blame them. Like, like, I get why they said that they are such a commercial publisher and what they, they produce is these sort of blockbuster type books. And that is definitely not what Truth Witch is. It's very complex, high fantasy. Um, but it was also not what I was trying to do with that book. And so we decided to take a chance and go out right widely and toward the team picked me up. Yay. And now they're the ones publishing this too. So sorry, Harper. I guess that's now filmed forever. <laughs> I do love you, Harper Collins. You were good to me while I was there. Uh, unfortunately, no one read those books, which wasn't Harper's fault. That's just the way the market works. They are out of print, in fact. So if you are able to track down a physical copy of the first book, you are winning the lottery because they do not exist anywhere except used now. Um, and yeah, that kind of makes me sad. But also it's kind of like, you know, it was my first series, so maybe it's good people don't read it. I'm a much better writer now. Did any of you read it? Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do think there's still Susan Dinnard books, and I've learned a lot about, you know, prose and story construction. But there's something, too, about when you're a beginner where you don't have the filters and the cr critical inner editor yet, and you write so much more from that place of id and joy. And I do think that really comes across in my first series. Um, but none of you, well, a few of you will have read it, but the rest of you, ha, ha, ha. I guess you can buy the ebook, unfortunately. I mean, I say unfortunately because at a certain point, when you sell below a certain threshold, you get the rights back. But I still continue to sell copies of ebooks, so I will never get those rights back. Curses. It'd be so cool to self publish them. I am rambling. Okay, back to the luminaries. So in 2019, I was sitting at LaGuardia and didn't really want to be alone in my head, so I decided to fill the time on Twitter, and rather than doom scroll, which we're all prone to do, I I don't even know how I thought of it. I just was like, let's like try to play a game on the internet on Twitter. 
and I did this second person, you wake up on the morning of your 16th birthday to a pro tapping at the window. And then I gave the world two choices and I figured like five people would vote and it would be a fun little thing that lasted a few days. And then that is not what happened at all. It turned into six months of thousands of people voting every day uh, on what Winnie Wednesday would do. They made terrible choices. I mean, horrible choices. You can go back and read the original thread, at least for now. Who knows what's going to happen in the next few days of Twitter. Um, or you can participate in the new Suze Your Own Adventure that I'm currently running uh, that I started a few weeks ago to like celebrate the release of the book. But it was such a fun thing that lasted for a lot longer than any of us expected. I'm sure my editor at the time of The Witchlands was like, please write your book. <laughs> but uh, I'm so glad I did it. And such an awesome community came out of it, the Luminerds, um, which are still very active and awesome and have helped support this book. And um, when it came time to sell another book, I dug out that old proposal and looked at it again. I tried to actually write the book kind of based on that proposal and then based on what we had come up with in the Twitter version. And I just couldn't do it. It wasn't working. And it took me a little while to figure out what was missing was the community element. It wasn't the same story when people weren't interacting and, and like literally fighting about which way to vote and getting their friends to come in and vote so it would sway their way. Um, and so I, I quickly realized like, okay, I can't try to replicate that. So instead I'm just gonna take the same characters, same world, totally different story, but lots of Easter eggs for the people who participated. There are quite a few nods just for you and not just in this book, in the sequels as well. Um, it is the first of a trilogy. I'm sorry, you have to wait. Um, and yeah, now here we are. How many years would that be? Three and a half years later, and the book is actually a published book. Whee! It's very thin, which I am very self-conscious of, but I promise it's a whole book. They just made it really small font. Um, it's a nine and a half hour uh, e um, audio book, so it's a proper book. It's just very tiny font. And you guys, I myself am also used to the fat books that are the Witchlands. So like when these came in the mail a few weeks ago, I was like, whoa, where did it go? <laughs> but that's why. There is small font. Tis a whole book. So that's the Witchland or the Luminary Spiel. I have finished the second book. It has a title. I don't think I'm allowed to tell you yet. Um, but I'll tell you the last Witchlands title if you guys want to know that. Do you want to know that? Um, I'm sure my publisher's like, what? No, <laughs> sorry. Uh, witch light, which makes sense, right? It's witch shadow, witch light. I feel like it's a logical follow-up and conclusion. Uh, and I, I'm actually working on that right now. I wrote part of it last year and then I like was really struggling with it because you guys, if you follow me online, know I had no childcare for the first two years of my daughter's life, which was really hard. <laughs> um, and I finally got a babysitter this summer and wow, holy smokes, you guys. Four hours a day of uninterrupted time is amazing. It, it like completely transforms your life. And you also wonder what you were doing before you had a child because I clearly wasted all my time. Uh, I'm Yeah, you can get a lot done in four hours. And the brain is really good at being like, this is it, this is your only time. I don't care what noises I hear out there. <laughs> they may continue and scream. I am, that's the babysitter's problem. And yes, so I've been working on Luminaries 2, just finished that. Um, I've done a little bit of Luminaries 3 and Witchlight. So I don't know when it will be released, I'm sorry, but it is on the way. Do any of you have questions as I continue to stream of consciousness ramble upon you? Because I will gladly do that. Very good at it. Yes. No. <laughs> to some people? Is that a thing? I guess I'm doing it wrong. No, I, I know. Oh, actually, that's a lie. I do know. Oh my gosh, I do know. You're, that was a good question. I forgot. I actually do know exactly what the line is of the witch light. Um, I don't know for Luminary 3. Ugh, J. Boop. Um, yeah, I don't know. But I do actually. That's so funny that you asked that. Huh, I was wrong. My knee jerk reaction was totally wrong. Do you want me to tell you? No, I'm not going to tell you because I think it won't be, it won't have, it, I want you to end on that note of like, oh, Suze, I feel so happy now. So these girls went through so much, but I like to end books on hope in the end. Um, have any of you read Witch Shadow yet? Yeah, a few of you. That gets dark. 
that gets real intense. It was really hard for me to write that while going through IVF, pregnancy, traumatic childbirth, and then a newborn. Um, it got real dark, but I think it's ultimately very uplifting. I want to get that for those of you who are now like, well, now I'm never going to read it, Susan. I promise it has a very hopeful and happy ending because that's how I am. That's how I see the world. I'm definitely a glass half full kind of person, even though I like, have any of you read the luminaries yet? Yes. A few of you? Yes. Winnie is very grumpy as a character and kind of grouchy. And I feel like that's me, but it's not real. Like at the end of the day, I'm actually a super positive and happy person. Don't come and test that. <laughs> Let's not try to bring me down. Um, other questions? Yes. Go internet. Thank you. Gosh, I don't know that there's any rule I adhere by except that I want it to be a satisfying read, um, which can mean so many different things for so many different people. I know what I think is satisfying, and so I and I have a very strict idea of what that looks like, um, and I have come to accept that it's not what everyone else uh, thinks is a good story. How many of you liked Ted Lasso season two? Because I didn't, and I'm like the only person in the world who didn't. So clearly I'm wrong, but I have I know what I like, and so that is sort of the the standard by which I I live, and and those are the sort of I guess I should look at the camera to you, dear, dear viewer. Uh, that is sort of the rule that I adhere to is just like, is this a good story to me? Um, and I will not rest or turn in the book until I think it is that good. Like I have a very debilitating fear that will not allow me to turn in a book that is not the best I could make it to my editor, which is not what the editor is for. She's there to make the book better. So it is silly of me to spend so much time editing and revising and making it better before I give it to her, but I cannot hand it to her in anything less than the best shape I can make it. I don't know what will happen to me if I do. I will crumble into dust. At least that's what it feels like, the terror of turning in something that is the best. And so that best, I know what that is, and I work very hard to reach it, and that is kind of the only rule that I adhere to. Otherwise, I have done so many different types of story. I've written in different points of view, different tenses, different formats, you know, site which is written down footage. Um, I, I just don't think, I think it's the whole, like, know the rules so you can break them. I do think there's some truth to that. Uh, but I also think it's okay not to know the rules and to just write what you like. Going back to what I said at the beginning, following that id and what first drives you. So, yes, that's my answer. Any other questions? Wow, you guys are really, you need to pick up, okay? <laughs> the internet is winning. So that's a really good question. I have so much trauma wrapped up in the Witchlands because of everything that was going on throughout Witch Shadow for me personally. It's really hard not to like go back into that state of the constant low grade trauma of IVF that lasted so long, um, miscarriage. Then my pregnancy was really physically difficult. I really struggled to like get through pregnancy. My hips were coming apart. I know Whew. it was painful. Um, and then my also almost died in childbirth, which if you follow me online, you know, I sh really should not be alive today. And then I had to come home and immediately finish Witch Shadow. It took two weeks off and then I started working again, which don't do that guys. <laughs> it's, I guess it's the same fear of turning in a book. That's not as good as it could be. It's this fear of letting people down. I made myself finish that book. I gave myself shingles from stress. Like, don't do that. It's just a book. And I, in hindsight, I'm, I'm like, why did I do that to myself? I'll never do it again. I probably will do it again. <laughs> but hopefully I don't have nearly the same traumatic circumstances behind me. Um, but it is, it is one of those things where it's like, it was just a book. Why did I do that to myself? You all would have waited. You all are very patient people, but I couldn't. And, um, and so going back to working on Witchlight has been, it's been something that I'm like, I can feel my body go into this place of fear and parent panic. Um, but then a few weeks ago at an event, I guess it was at New York Comic Con, so a month ago, a reader said, like, maybe what you need to do is view the last book as your recovery, as your healing book. You know, like, instead of seeing it as, like, you're going back into this trauma state, 
looking at it as like, how can I work through the trauma with the book? And I was like, that is awesome. I have no idea what that means, but that is awesome. I'm going to do that. I'm going to figure out what that means and try to do that. Um, and I feel like that has been really, it's, it's something has shifted in my brain. And now I'm like, Oh wait, no, I feel you again. I feel it's old and sloppy again. And I'm like, Oh, there's many chills. Huh? Like, ah, it's not bad. There's actually so much that I love about this world. And yes, it was a hard time, but I'm through that time. My daughter's two and a half now. She's awesome, by the way. And yeah, and we have this new book. I've already written a sequel. I've already started the third. Like, it's time to like go back there. And it's called Witch Light. It's obviously going to be hopeful. So anyway, that is that is what's happening with the witch land. So thank you for that question. Um, yes, finally. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you for that. Okay. So the lady of Charlotte is a free, well, not free, actually. You have to be a paid subscriber to my newsletter um, to read it. It was a novel that I wrote last year. I, I like last year, I was like, I'm going to learn to write short stories. I'm really bad at it. So I'm going to write one a month and the internet can do it with me. And then I was terrible at it. Nothing was shorter than 10,000 words. Um, and this was 13,000 words, which is a novelette, not a short story. And I hated every second of doing that challenge and I will never do it again. And I was like, you know what? The lesson I learned from this is that I am not a short story writer and that's okay. It's okay to be a novel writer. Um, the thing about The Lady of Charlotte, which is a rom-com, not my usual genre at all, is that I can't fill a book with it. Like that's all I've got <laughs> was the 13,000 words. Like my agent, I gave it to her and she was like, you need like three times this for it to sell anywhere. This is just, this is just the fun scenes. We need all the other stuff. And I was like, but that's the only scenes I care about. <laughs> so I, it's like half of the story is kissing. <laughs> so, um, I'm glad you liked it though. It was really fun to write. It's about an experimental archeologist and a blacksmith. Uh, who works at the castle with her, but um, yes, I don't think I could actually write it. I tried to write years ago a contemporary romance like YA, because I enjoyed reading it. This was like a decade ago. No, more than that. It was like 2010. And I only made it probably about the same, 15,000 words or so before I was like, we need murder. So then I added murder. I became a cozy mystery because that's, I love reading cozy mysteries. That's like my favorite genre to read. Um, and even that wasn't enough for me to fill a book. And so suddenly it became a murder mystery with ghosts who are killing people, which is now The Executioner's Three, which you can read for free on Wattpad. So I just can't do anything that doesn't have murder, usually with some kind of fantastical element. I love reading those sorts of things that don't have that, but I am like, it's, I don't know how people sustain it for the length of a novel. I cannot do it. I am amazed by authors who can. Um, yeah. Do any of you write? Yes. Yes. Do you write rom-com? Yes. Okay, then. I bow to you. I, I genuinely cannot. I, I can't do it, so good for you. And, and same, like, I love historical romance, but I can't. Just I just can't. So it will never be longer than probably 13 to 15,000 words if I ever do write more of those. Yes. But thank you for reading it and asking about it. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Internet wins again. In the luminaries, I assume they mean, or in which lands? We can do both. In the luminaries, it's obviously Jay. Jay is called hashtag of Jay because when I introduced him in the Twitter adventure, I think I asked the hive mind Winnie, as they called themselves, who they were calling, I think, or maybe it was who was at the cabin when they got there. I'd have to go look, but I think I, I wrote the option as Erica or Ugg comma J. And Alexander London, who is also an author, was like, obviously, hashtag Ugg J. And that is how the hashtag came about. And now it's famous, um, at least for people on Twitter. So J is sort of like the biggest cookie of that series. like. For me, he's like, you know, the brooding guy with his mysteries. And he and Winnie used to be friends, and now they're enemies, which is maybe my favorite trope ever. So that's, that's answer one. For the Witchlands, my favorite side character is Leopold. 
I shall say nothing more. Read the series to understand, particularly Witch Shadow. Yes, those who have read Witch Shadow are both nodding emphatically. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. Do we have other questions? Yes. I have a master's degree in marine ecology. I worked in data analysis. I used to um, ecologically model ecosystems. So I worked with Arctic fish, um, the Greenland halibut. I could not do any of that now. I like recently pulled out my old peer review publications and I was like, I don't know what any of this means. I literally have no idea what any of this means. Um, couldn't even talk about it now, but I love science. I, I was always a writer for fun and a storyteller growing up, but I never like shared my fiction with anyone. Um, and when I went to undergraduate, I wanted to be a writer. That was what I thought I would do. I went to the University of Georgia because they have this great thing where you can go to school for free if you have all A's. So I did that. And I, they don't have a career, they didn't have a creative writing major. They just had English and then you could sort of specialize a little in creative writing. I took one semester of English coursework and hated it so much. <laughs> I guess I'm just not meant to, you know, literate, uh, analyze um, literary greats. That just didn't do it for me. And I had to take a required science class to fulfill the requirement. And it was marine biology because everyone said it was easy and fun. And then I fell in love with that and switched to that and then got a, uh, a degree in statistics as well. So apparently I was really good at that kind of math, but don't ask me to do arithmetic and, or calculate your tip. Cause I don't, I don't know. Um, and then I went and did that and went to graduate school for that too. Thought I was going to save the world from overfishing and then um, met a French guy. He and I hit it off. He was going to Europe and I was going to go get my PhD and then he proposed and I was a very naive 25 year old and I was like, yes, I will go with you to this country where I speak none of the language. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, yeah, 10 out of 10 don't recommend. Um, maybe be a little bit more prepared. But then again, when you're 25, any of you who are 25, it's a great age to be. You have no fear. Now I look back and I'm like, I would never do that now. Um, I'm afraid to like cross the street now, especially since becoming a mom. Any of you who are moms, I feel like now all I do is live in here. Um, so yes, I went with him. I was doing freelance data analysis for my graduate university, um, which was very unfulfilling. Analyzing other people's and modeling other people's data was like, like the whole fun is the field work. So if you're not going to do the field work and you just have to analyze someone else's data, it was not great, but it paid the bills. And, um, but I started writing again and like taking it seriously, started researching, how do you write? How do you get an agent? What are the steps of publishing? And I spent, I wrote a book. It was so bad. It was a rom-com <laughs> and it was so terrible. And, um, I set it aside and then I wrote something strange and deadly during NaNoWriMo of 2009 and spent a year revising that, getting critique partners, getting feedback. And then sold it a little bit after that. Yeah. Um, and then I was very naive as well and was like, yeah, I don't need to keep working. Yeah, no. Um, the thing about being self-employed is one, you pay way more taxes than you do if you work for a company, which eats up about a third of what you're getting paid. Plus you have agency fees, so you lose 15% as well. Um, and yeah, I definitely went full time like way too soon. <laughs> and my husband and I were living off real tight income for a while there. We made it, obviously. And when Truth Witch took off, then things became significantly easier for both of us. Um, but yeah, I couldn't get a mortgage when we moved to the US. So that's another thing about being an author, a creator. Uh, you're not a reliable income. Banks don't really want to give you money, which is fair. I wasn't making very much money and my husband being French didn't qualify. They wouldn't look at his income. So yeah, lots of things I did when I was younger that now I'm telling you be smarter, except also if you're young and you can do it, maybe don't, it all, it all seems to work out. 
whenever like I see young writers who are saying my parents don't support this, I kind like I want to say I do say I get your parents' point of view. They are just looking out for you. It is not necessarily that they don't believe in your dream. It is just a very hard dream to make work, truly, and to do full time. And so there is a lot to be said for getting a degree in something else because you do not have to major in creative writing to become a writer. I don't actually know. I know maybe two of my friends who actually have degrees in that, but, but none of my good friends. They came from all sorts of backgrounds. One has um, a history major, one worked in graphic design, one was a makeup artist. One of my friends pumped gas while he wrote his book. I mean, there's just no wrong way to do it and pay the bills. And many of my friends still have day jobs or other streams of income to help supplement because it can be such an unsteady stream. And I feel like I'm being very negative. Follow your dreams. <laughs> just don't come to me if you can't pay the bills. Do we have other questions? No, we got two. We'll start here because they're losing, so. <laughs> It is so hard. Okay. I, obviously everybody is different and there is literally no right, wrong way to write a novel. If you get words down and they form a story, good for you. Uh, anytime I see someone say, this is the way you do it. And you, when you do it this way, you're going to suddenly be so much faster. No, everyone's different. Everyone's brain is different. What works for someone might work for you, but it also might not. And don't feel bad if it doesn't. I spent years trying to like adhere to other people's methods, even things my agent wanted me to do. Um, and it was like, oh wait, this just isn't how my brain is wired. So what I have discovered for me is that I'm really good at first books and then everything falls apart in the series. I, I, am, I never thought I was, but I am actually something of a pantser, meaning I write by the seat of my pants without a plan, which you can do in first books. And then you get to the sequels and you have to deal with the consequences of everything that you made up in the first one. And so the, the way that I now reckon with that is that I, and I talked about this in a recent newsletter, actually, which you can find. It was my most recent one. Um, so it should be prominent on the Substack page um, about, it's a, that I make, essentially I keep giant, like so many stacks of index cards in which I list all the books I've made to the reader. So um, I knew the Witchlands, well, when I sold the Witchlands, we sold four books. It is now six. <laughs> So clearly I didn't plan that well at all. Um, and I, essentially all of the promises that I made in Truth Witch, I then had to follow up with in the sequels and I tried to organize them accordingly. Um, I just made too many, so we keep needing more books. And I actually wanted to have seven, but you know, they were like, no, we're gonna stick with six. So I had to make Witch Shadow into two books into one, which is another thing you can read about on my newsletter. Cause that was like, the hardest creative challenge of my life. Um, but that is something that I highly recommend if you're like me and you tend to just figure things out initially and then you're left dealing with all the consequences uh, is to go through and figure out all the promises that you're making to the reader. So maybe you have introduced a mystery that obviously needs to be wrapped up. That's an obvious promise. But maybe there's littler things too. Like maybe you've mentioned, because as a pantser, I discover things as I'm going. And so I will, as I'm writing, suddenly realize like, oh my gosh, Winnie's dad left the family four years ago. That's very early in the book, like literally page one, I'm not spoiling anything. Um, why? I don't know, but we better figure that out. That is a promise I'm making to the reader right away. Like where did dad go? What happened? Um, and so I keep my stack of index cards and for the Witchlands it was very, very big. And as I do address them in sequels, like usually when I am coming into a sequel, I will take the stack and figure out what is like, feels like the right place for these reveals to be happening based on the characters, where they are and how I want to pace things. And then I take those out and make sure that I somehow address them in the book. And if I don't, which definitely kept happening and that's why the series kept growing, I end the book with a, still a big stack. Um, but any cards that got dealt with got pushed aside. And I will say Witch Shadow, and those of you who have read it know, so many cards, so many reveals in that book. It is just like one reveal after another throughout the book. So I got through a lot of index cards on that one, which was very satisfying. But yeah, I, I don't, everyone's different. Um, if you are a meticulous outliner, then outline if you enjoy that and it works for you. 
I also, if you don't know yet, then try it and see. I thought I was a meticulous outliner, and then I discovered when I was trying to create Windwitch and killing myself and struggling to find the story that no, I'm actually not. Um, I, I am more of a vague outliner. I know the emotional beats I'm heading for and the big reveals from my promise cards, and otherwise I need to figure it out as I go, how I'm going to get there, figure it out in the moment. This is why sequels take me much longer to write than first books or standalones. I, I have vowed I will never write another series, but <laughs> here we are. <laughs> Apparently, I cannot, I cannot do anything but. Uh, all right, internet question, go. Oh, that's a good one. I mean, the Luminaries is cool, but it's it's kind of culty. Let's be real; it's a secret society. Um, they have there's very weird culture going on that is part of their world. Um, when he th thinks throughout the bulk book that culture runs thicker than blood, and it's this thing that she's never really questioned, and now that she's spent four years sort of on the outskirts of the society and she's back in the thick of it, she's like, "Wow, this place is weird. How did I never see this?" Um, but it'd be cool too. They have lots of cool things. You get to like, I, you know, hunt nightmares at night. That's pretty cool. Um, in the third book, this is hinted at, so it's not a spoiler. There's this big week long festival festival called the nightmare masquerade, which would be super fun to attend. Um, so, you know, I, I could, I wouldn't mind popping in with like a tourist. Um, I could stay alive and I would, I would be a Wednesday. You can take the quiz on my Twitter. Um, or on the Luminards website, which you can all find on my website. Just go to the Luminaries book page. You can find all that stuff. And you can take the quiz and find out what clan you would be. And I took my own quiz, which I realize means I am biased. But I didn't actually go in making the quiz in order to, you know, favor myself. Um, and I was a Wednesday, which didn't surprise me at all, because I think Winnie is a lot like me. So I hope you like Winnie. <laughs> And as for the Witchlands, I mean, it would be cool to see the Witchlands. It would be cool if this TV show happens. Um, can't tell you anything about that. But um, I, I don't think I'd actually want to live there. Right now, things are kind of tense and fraught. Maybe in like a few decades after the Witchlands series is over and I give you my final line that will, I promise, make you feel things, <laughs> um, then... Yeah, then I would want to go visit, and I would I would love to be a water witch. Maybe it's the marine biology, maybe it's because I'm a Pisces, but it would be cool to be a water witch like Styx. Or even just a tide witch like Vivia. It would be cool. Um, if you guys want a funny story about that. So, when I first made up the witch lands, literally everyone in the world was a witch. Everybody had a magic. And it was like such obscure magics. Like, every... There were, Basically, if you were good at anything, it was your witchery, and you, so, like, I even had, I'm embarrassed by this, I even had a barley witch who grew barley. <laughs> like, it was literally in my notes. <laughs> I mean, I assume that's what they did. I don't know. I found the notes a few years ago, and I was like, barley witch? What were you on? <laughs> um, and, yeah, fortunately, when I tried to sell it, the editor at Tortine, who was interested, was like, she gave me what's called a revise resubmit, which means that you revise based on the editor's notes, resubmit with the hopes that then they think they can offer on it and convince the sales team and the rest of the department to buy it. And her note was like, I think the magic is a little much. Can we simplify and just have like, just like the main elements, you know, water witch, air witch, whatever. Um, and I was like, or <laughs> how about we just have six categories and all my other witches just fall into those. That's not more complicated. It's totally more complicated. Um, but she was okay with that. I tricked her. And she accepted that. Um, I did, obviously, not everyone is now a witch in the world. Most people are not. Um, and it is more rare. But, yes, now you still have, you have the main elements. And then things like a tide witch is part of the water witchery category. It's very complicated. Um, but it seems to be going okay. You, see, you guys seem to be following along pretty well. So, thanks. I have a convoluted brain. So anyway, that's how the Witchlands magic came to be. That's why there are six elements. Now you know. Other, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I know in like in my Wattpad book, the Ex Executioner's Three, the the main character Freddie and her best friend Divya play um, 
a D and D spinoff called The Witchlands, and their characters are soft and assault in their game. Um, but no, I don't have anything like that in the Luminaries. And if Executioner Three ever gets published, I don't know if I'm allowed to have that, but we'll see. I hope so. It'd be cool. Um, I don't think so. I'd have to think. I mean, one thing I have in all of my novels from the very beginning, from Something Strange and Deadly, which is about um, a girl in 1876 Philadelphia who has to, who, when Philly, Philly gets run over by zombies, but they're like magic zombies, they're necromancers, and her brother's been kidnapped by the necromancers, so she has to find a way to get him back. And one of the lessons she learns early on is that she can take down the zombies if she aims for the knees with her parasol. And so aim for the knees is what I wrote as the inscription in the first in Something Strange and Deadly when it first came out. And so now every series has aim for the knees somewhere. It's in the Witchlands, and it's also in Luminaries. It's in the definition for the vampire, and you will find it in the second trial. So, yes. I have to be at the mic, don't I? I'm a wanderer. I hate standing still. Can I carry it? You're nodding at me like, yeah? No? Okay, then we'll stay still. I'll just tap my foot like Sophie does. Um, a scene I had to cut. Well, in my very first series, I will tell you that my editor, I don't want to spoil anything, did not like the ending and did not want me to do it. And I was like, she was like, you're going to lose so many readers. I was like, I don't have any readers, okay? There's no one to lose. No one read this book. So I'm going to go my way. Um, have any of you guys ever seen the movie Stranger Than Fiction with Will Ferrell? So good. Oh my God, so good. That is actually how I felt and when, when I was making this decision with my editor. I was like, it could be a good book or it could be a great book. And I'm going with great. I don't care if I lose readers. There ain't any of them anyway. There were five of you. Thank you. All five of you. Um, that's, there's that. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Otherwise, I don't think so. I mean, the editor's job is to make the book better. And while I've certainly heard of people's editors saying, change this or else, I have never had that experience. I've only had my editor say, you know, I think we need to bring this out more. Let's fix this. But if you feel strongly the other way, then we'll go your way. Um, so, and usually what I find, what I've discovered is that editors don't know what they're talking about. They do, of course they do, but it's not what they suggest is the solution is very rarely actually the solution and possibly even what they suggest is wrong isn't actually what's wrong. It is very hard to get to the source of what is wrong with the story. Um, and we tend to say things like, ah, oh, well, it was just boring. Was it? Or were you just not connecting with the character? Maybe that was the problem. And so it's like, a, I feel like a detective game. I'm trying to figure out what's the actual problem. I also have lots of people read my books. I really love critique partners and beta readers so that I can get a slew of feedback and sort of wade through what is consistent and um, and what, you know, people disagree. And so who do I agree with and who do I want to listen to? But yeah, I don't think there's ever anything I kept. Usually I'm the one who like cuts and reworks way more than my editor ever asked me to. I know with the luminaries, she came back with like almost no notes for my first draft. And I was like, nice. All right. I don't agree. <laughs> I'm going to completely <laughs> redo this. And uh, I did. I completely, I mean, originally Winnie's character was a, was a bit different. Um, and I actually ended up rewriting her whole character. And if you change one thing in a character, then you kind of have to rewrite every scene because it ripples out. Um, but it was totally worth doing. And I think it was a lot better because of that choice. And when I gave it to her, she was like, whoa, okay, cool. I see what you did there. Um, but as you guys can tell, I am... <laughs> extremely hard on myself and my books but I also like fixing things um, my favorite video games are usually games with like lots of puzzles you have to figure out and I feel like that is just the way my brain works probably why I went to science too experimental research design yeah mm -hmm. you're nodding so I that's how my brain works and not everyone is um, I my friends all turn to me for critiquing because I am that way because they know that they can give me the book and I'll be like yes let us find what is broken get ready <laughs> and they're in, just like don't want to talk to me ever again I'm gonna break their souls but their books are better. <laughs> uh, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. can't pick that. I can't. Only because when I am in that person's head, I'm like, I love you so much. And it's really, 
I have to feel that way or I literally cannot write them. If I don't like them, I mean, or I find them interesting. That's a better way to put it. I, there are plenty of people, characters that I'm like, mm, I don't know about you, but I find them interesting and I can hear their voice. And when I'm in their head, I'm like, oh yes, this is cool. Um, but yeah, then also I usually do love them in some way. Um, <laughs> last night at my event, uh, a woman got a phone call in the middle of it and left. And I don't think she realized like we, there's just bookshelves that we can still hear you. <laughs> and I felt really bad because she was having a very loud argument and it was like, I'll just talk louder. <laughs> um, yes. And then everyone just pretended like we couldn't hear when she came back. Um, so don't do that. <laughs> Actually leave the store if you're going to have a phone call. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if there's anyone who's my favorite right now because I'm back in which light at the moment. I'm like really excited about age when, you know, who isn't? <sighs> angry blood witch. Actually, he's not angry. He's just, I don't know. What word would you guys use to describe him? Fruity. Yeah. He's really stuck in his feelings, but he doesn't know what they are. He's like, I have feelings, but I don't understand any of them. He's like my toddler. <laughs> <laughs> we got a poster to like help with tantrums that shows all these cartoon faces of feelings. Um, you know, below it, like angry, happy, sad. And so whenever she's having a meltdown, we're like, show us what you feel. Show us what you feel. She just ripped that thing off the wall. <laughs> it was like. F you guys. <laughs> Too many feelings. All of them. Yeah. And then like any of, there's a few of them with like cartoon glasses and they're all mama. <laughs> Doesn't matter what the gender is or the hair length. Mama. So yes. Um, someone else had a hand I think. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you guys. This book was such a joy to write. Um, I really needed something that was an escape after the tra challenges of Witch Shadow. And to be like honest, I'm really proud of Witch Shadow. I think it is the most technically advanced book I have ever written and possibly ever will. I learned more about craft writing that book than anything I've done. Um, but it was dark, even though it ends hopeful, it was dark and it was hard. And I finished it at the beginning of COVID with a newborn and I just needed something that was real easy. And it was like purely for me. Um, and so the luminaries, this whole book was just a joy to write. It was just every trope I love. It was like, I'm just writing anything I like. Is there a, ch a scene where she gets dressed up and her friends make her prettier? Yes, there is. <laughs> uh, in you know, the friends to enemies to, I don't know, what are they? Yes, we got that. Um, you know, the trials, hunter trials. I like that sort of stuff. I love, I love like writing fight and action scenes. So it's lots of that sort of stuff. Um, is there a scene where he corrects her stance while she's aiming with the bow at a target? Yes, of course there is. Um, it's like all the little things that I love most that are crammed into this series. Um, you may not love them, but I don't really care. It was for me. I needed it. And it was, it was, it was probably the fastest thing I've ever written. Um, and no, it's not short. As we established, it's a full book. I wrote that book in like two months. So it was, it was two nanoramas back to back. And it was just awesome. And um, the second one was so much harder because it was like, oh, consequences. I made promises. What are they? I don't know. Um, but I am finding now that all the challenges I had in the second book, aligning all the different plot, because this book, with, this is a spoiler, it ends with two very open mysteries. And so in the second book, it was like a matter of really carefully laying all of that down and all of the clues to build toward what I knew I wanted to be at the end of that book. Um, and now the third book's going really easy. So yay, all the hard work of book two. And the other thing that was happening during book two was my, my daughter was getting bigger and larger and sleeping less. And I didn't have childcare. So it was like, oh, wow, my work hours are shrinking every day. And my energy is shrinking because, oh my gosh, small children are, well, they rip posters off the wall. <laughs> that should tell you everything you need to know. Um, I swear she's a normal child, mostly. Yes. It's going well, yes. I mean, ask me again in a year, but.
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually think that's a big part of why, like, The Witchlands is such a long, sweeping series. There's no real overall structure like that. Each book is meant to follow one character slightly more, even though there are multiple points of view. And so I have to arrange that entire book. So Wind Witch, for example, is Merrick's book. So I have to arrange his arc first, and then everything that he does and, and grows then is echoed in everyone else's story. So I always write each point of view separately. I write the main point of view first and then write all the others because I know that I want their arc to echo his. And then I have to hit all my promises for the story plot as well. So those are like very carefully assembled books. Um, and the, the Luminaries though is three books, which is a very nice structure and I've done it before, right? My first series was a trilogy. So that's not new for me. Um, and I do think it's a comfortable thing. I think because I don't know that I necessarily follow the traditional three act structure, but I do think I tend to have that sort of arrangement of beats, the rising action, and then the high climax in the fall. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of it. I feel like I did all of the muddle in book two of getting all the plot threads down. And now, I mean, there is still a whole story. I do think that each book should stand alone. Like, you wouldn't necessarily want to, but if you pulled the second book out of something strange and deadly series or the luminaries, you could read it and have a, a beginning, middle and end with a satisfying conclusion to that book. Um, but yeah, it is much easier because the mystery and everything is now it's just writing it out, which is nice, especially because the witch lines is never, <sighs> don't write long series. You who asked me, just don't do it and don't give up your day job. Not really. Follow your dreams. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. In the luminaries, I assume. In anything. Well, I will say, um, let me think on that for a second. I kept thinking Erica would show up a lot more in the first and second book. And I, I really wanted her to because she was so prevalent in the Twitter version. Um, but I finally had to accept when I was writing book two that it just wasn't actually her time. And she's now a huge character in the third book. But um, because she wasn't actually that prevalent in the first, I didn't, and she is more in the second. I, um, I didn't really know that I knew her that well until I started trying to write her. And I definitely wrote her one way the first time in book two. And then was like, you know what? I actually think I've got her wrong. And I went back and redid her. And I think she's a much more interesting character now. Um, which happens, like, I think sometimes we get glued to something because that's how we see it and that's how we wrote it. Um, and in reality, there's nothing wrong with deleting it all and doing it again. In fact, sometimes that is absolutely what we need to do. It can be hard. I cannot tell you how many words I have cut. Every draft, every sequel is like, I write at least a book's worth of the scenes that I then cut and don't use. It is actually sad and depressing when I look at my cut folder and how many words it is. Um, but it seems to be the only way I can figure the story out after how many published books and also unpublished books. This is clearly the way my brain operates. I remember years ago seeing Kristen Kishore, who has a new book out right there, quite beautiful, um, talk about that when she was writing, what's the third one? Blue? Bitter Blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, she was talking about that and showing like all her rewritten pages and things. And I was like, oh, someone else like me and she's so successful and beloved. And so I was like, yay, it's not just me. There are just some brains that are wired that way. And we have to cycle through try after try after try until we find the right one. <sighs> yeah. So that's sort of my answer. Um, Erica ish. Any other questions? Yes, how are we on time? Yes, please. Thank you. Yes, I will say um, this was a long, I don't want to say battle because that implies a fight and there was definitely no fighting. It was a very, very, very good relationship. I have a great relationship with my publisher. I love them deeply. If you're watching, I love you. Um, genuinely. Um, and I think if, when we first were talking about it, I suggested a deer skull because I could just see that very vividly. And there is a part in the book where Winnie sees what's called a ghost deer. And it's like this really moving moment for her. 
in the, in the forest. And um, so I could just feel that. And this book is very atmospheric. It is a vibe very much. And I went into it like every word I chose is meant to evoke this vibe. And I could just see this deer skull with a lot of black around it. Um, they were not that into it initially, which is fair. I don't think I was doing a very good job explaining it. And the, I think someone somewhere was thinking that girl illustrations were really popular, so that's what we should do. And they are very popular. And we did actually try going in that direction, but um, it just didn't look right. It didn't work at all. And then they circled back to the deer skull and were like, what do you think of this? And I was like, yes, that was what I was trying to explain. You did it. Um, my daughter, she loves to like, doesn't matter how small the task, if she accomplishes it, she's like, I did it. So that's what I just thought of. I did it. We did it. We made a beautiful cover and it's just so beautiful. Um, I think it's really unique and special. And I'm just so glad that like we were able to collaborate and come up with that. And the, the artist they chose for it, she just knocked it out of the park and did so beautiful. Thank you, Tor, for watching. Um, yeah. So I definitely had input. I did not have input at my first publisher, which is not unusual. Every publisher is different. I mean, one of the things I love most about being at a small publisher like Tor is that I do have a lot, like, it's, it's a discussion. Um, they won't always, I won't always get final say. I mean, I don't. It's up to other departments because it is a whole team and, you know, you have to convince stores to buy it. So they probably know better than I do in the end. And I have to suck that up and accept it. Um, but yeah, uh, my first publisher, it was kind of like, here's your cover. Um, and I will be honest that I didn't like it. I hate saying that about it because it's, I don't blame the publisher. Girls and dresses were really hot back then. So that's what I had. Um, and it was a pretty cover. It just didn't fit the book. And it promised a very different book than what people got. Um, it promised a paranormal romance, which is not a paranormal romance. Spoiler alert, he dumps her at the end. So... I got some pretty angry emails about that, not going to lie. It's probably why the series didn't sell. Who knows? Um, and then they repackaged them with much better covers that I think are awesome, and I'm really grateful that they did that. Um, and then it still didn't sell. Alas, those of you who have a copy, you're special. If I ever get famous, you could probably sell it for money, but not yet. I'm not famous yet. Um, I think we've time for, like, one more question, probably, so... Yes. Possibly. I do wonder, like, what she'll think when she's old enough to read my books. Like, what is she going to think about these characters and what it says about me? Um, I think she is very much like Saki. <laughs> um, she is so incredibly headstrong and chaotic. I mean... We call her the Tasmanian Devil, uh, Taz, like, you know, the Looney Tunes character, because she's just constantly going and destroying things, and I guess I'm her assault, because I'm just cleaning it up. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. I guess we'll see. I don't necessarily draw on people I know for, for characters. They're just our voices in my head, <laughs> and I start to transcribe what they're doing onto the page. Um, but... Yeah, like, ask me again in 10 years when she is like, because she is clearly a fully formed human with a personality now, but we'll see what she actually, when she can like fully form sentences and have an attitude, I mean more of an attitude, pretty sure ripping the poster off the wall is indicative of her attitude. Um, we'll see. It would be, and I think too, when you become a mom, I see this with all my friends who have young kids, like you want to write for them. So I see a lot of them write picture books or you know they'll move into picture books or um chapter books one of my friends does that now so i could see myself definitely doing something like that so thanks for the question i love to talk about my daughter who doesn't all right thank you everyone thank you for thank you and thank you on the internet